Hello, this is David Rothenberg. I'm a photographer in New York, and I'm here with David Campney, the writer and curator and managing director of programs at the International Center of Photography in New York. We're here to talk about my new book, Roosevelt Station, which was just published by Perimeter Editions. Thanks so much for joining me, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I wanted to talk a bit about uh, the project, uh, which was which came about as the winner of the International Photo Book Prize, which was part of the International Festival of Photography uh, in Melbourne. Uh, David contributed an essay to the book and uh, yeah, I wanted to share some of the work and then we would have a conversation about it. Roosevelt Station is a series of candid photographs that I made starting in the beginning of 2019 and up until early 2020 at my neighborhood train station in Jackson Heights in Queens in New York. Uh, like a number of other recent projects of mine, it's, it's a project that looks at a subject that's essentially in my backyard in Queens. Uh, the project began uh, as part of uh, my morning commute when I would head into the city uh, to teach photography in Manhattan. And so during those sort of spare few minutes, I, I'd have my camera and I'd photograph people passing through the station. Uh, that particular semester, I was, I had much more of a standard rush hour morning commute and I really started to take note of this remarkable quality of light that came from the transom windows up above the station, uh, which was um, a commissioned artwork by the glass artist Tom Patty. Uh, so essentially this win window array produces this pretty incredible spectrum of light. Um, that shines down during the morning hours. When I first uh, really started to, to work on this project, I, I noticed uh, sort of the theatrical effects of this light on the subject. Uh, I was really interested in how a candid photograph could, could take on these theatrical properties. Um, and I started to envision the project more as a book and think, started to think about how I could create sort of an approximation of the space in the station of the architecture and how it could bring the viewer through that space. As you can see in a number of the photographs, uh, the photographs represent a real diversity of, of people at uh, Jackson Heights and the surrounding neighborhoods are said to be some of the most culturally diverse places in the United States, if not the world. And I was fascinated in how this quality of light could sort of create a sort of unifying uh, quality to these images. Uh, I was, you know, I was interested in reflecting or um, describing that this, this uh, sense of diversity, but I was reluctant. I didn't want to have the images reduce people into typologies or types. So I found that, that the light allowed me to sort of avoid that effect. Oftentimes uh, when I arrive at the station and I looked at the whole concourse ahead, it, the light shone down and it really sort of felt like, uh, like, a, like a stage set or a film set. Um, the seven train, the elevated train would arrive at the station above and then and then a rush of people would come down the stairs and race to make the transfer to the below ground trains. And it, so it started to feel like, like a performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And what kind of heightened that was, you know, at times there'd be these punctuations of very quiet moments, uh, which is represented in some of these photos. And, you know, MTA workers, the station workers would come through during those kind of intermissions and sweep the floor. And so it really felt like, like a production, like a stage hand coming through. Uh, as you, you can see here, uh, this glass block uh, walls of the station, which was another aspect I was interested in photographing. One thing that interested me about uh, these subjects and just sort of the rush hour commute in general was sort of this transition that people would go through when they'd be coming from their, their personal or private lives at home and heading to the workplace. So they were sort of in this in-between state between the private and the public.
uh, one of the things I was interested about the book format was the ability to create relationships between images. For instance, on this spread, uh, I wanted a suggestion of this, this man on the right, his, his hand casting the shadow on the, on the page on the left, um, to, to sort of to bring out these new relationships uh, between uh, separate people and the subjects. Um, and that, that's all I really wanted to say for now, but I wanted to <laughs> save some time for, for David, uh, which I'm so glad you're here to, to share your thoughts and uh, talk a bit about the essay. Uh, Great. Well, um, congratulations on the book, David. I guess what you can't, what nobody can ever see from a PDF or a screen is, uh, you know, how a book is as, as, a, as an object. And it's an extremely, it's an extremely beautiful one. Um, Obviously, you, you were showing me various versions and, and PDFs as we went along, but it, it, it's never the same as the, the final thing. So congratulations to you and to uh, <clears throat> Perimeter for such a fabulous uh, production. Um, Thank you. When you asked me to write, you, you know, I immediately wanted to. And um, you know, as you indicated there, as you went through the book, there's any, any number of ways of thinking about a set of pictures like this, just because the there are so many different kind of frames of reference that um, an association that, that come to mind with you know such a rich uh, body of work, and I, I did actually write uh, three three separate essays. There there is only one in the book, but to kind of get to it, um, I, I wrote a couple of others, and one of them was just about light. Um, and then I thought, well, your handling of light is so uh, beautiful and intelligent in the book that um, you don't really want anybody writing about light in the back. Um, so I scrapped that one. Um, and the, the one I did write was to do with um, something you touched on about um, public spaces now becoming quite theatrical. Uh, public space is something that almost expects to be imaged somehow, whether it's by a photographer or by surveillance, you know, public spaces are, are very image conscious and a lot of them are now designed with uh, not just the experience of the space in mind, but the experience of the space as an image. I mean, that must have been what informed um, uh, the light or the glass colored glass installation that's there, you know, it, it must, it, they must have had in mind that somehow that installation would travel in the form of images. I don't suppose they were expecting a photographer as good as you, but um, be that as it may, that, that's what I did write about. Um, and uh, the, the third one was really to do with, um, I suppose the place of, um, the train station and the and the subway concourse within uh, photography and, and film to an extent, and that's actually what I'll talk about. It's something I mentioned a little in the essay, but um, not to any great degree. Um, so my my text is at the back, uh, and I wanted it at the back uh, because it's by no means an introduction to the work. The work doesn't need any introduction, so it, it's really a kind of afterword something that you might want to read having looked at the the pictures it's hard to think of the the subway without thinking of walker evans's pictures um certainly for me and i know for a lot of other photographers and i know that david was aware of these um so uh, evans goes on to the subway in 38 and again, a couple of years later, and he's he's working at the very limits of what you can shoot down there in the subway car itself. Very very dim light. He's got a hidden camera. Um, he's shooting in winter, and it's under his coat, and the lens is poking through between two buttons, and he's got a, a long cable release. So it's it's very surreptitious work, almost like a spy. And uh, although it was made then, it was the work wasn't seen for a whole number of years. And in fact, it, it appeared in a few different journals and magazines uh, first. Uh, uh, here it is in, in Harper's Bazaar, of all things, the um, kind of fashion and style magazine in the early 
1960s, around the time he had a little display of these pictures at the Museum of Modern Art. And he, he made about 600 and each time he's cropping them and framing them differently. Uh, maybe we'll get on to cropping and framing uh, when we talk about your work, David, because I don't know about, and I never asked you whether there was any, but he kept chopping and changing this body of work. And each time the emphasis would move somewhere else, you know, because it's a kind of, if you stand in a place and you make lots of pictures, you end up, it's like trawling in a way, or it certainly was for Evans. And then you've got to catch a body of work and you have to shape it. And I, and I think Evans struggled to shape this. Um, and so it, so it appeared in different ways at different times. Um, and I loved his description, which, which he wrote about the subway car. Um, the setting is a sociological gold mine uh, awaiting a major artist. Uh, meanwhile, it can be the dream location for any portrait photographer weary of the studio and of the horrors of vanity. I, th I think that was a little poke at Harper's Bazaar <laughs> magazine, which was a fashion magazine, uh, essentially. So these are, they're not models and it's not a studio. Um, so it's quite subversive, I think, that he even managed to get it published there. Anyway, when he was down in the subway, he, um, the photographer Helen Levitt accompanied him. Um, and they, I think they even photographed each other at one point. Uh, but Levitt actually returned on and off to photograph on the subway in, in the coming decades. So, and those pictures were all rounded up, published a few years ago in this book called Manhattan Transit that I, that I wrote a text for published by Koenig in, in Germany, although the text is in English. Um, and I think that period, 30s to the end of the 70s, I think our last pictures are 78. I think that's interesting because that really is the period when image consciousness, being conscious of being an image for others or being imaged for others in, in public space um, really accelerates. And, and when you start to look at subway pictures taken thereafter they do feel more theatrical and they do feel more cinematic and I don't know if that's just the way that photographers were shooting or the way subjects were behaving uh what the relation is between the the two of those things but, but it's it's fascinating and it's pretty unavoidable if you if you trace this um lineage a set of pictures called heads by um Philip Lorca de Corsia shot around two decades ago, um, not in the subway, shot in very bright daylight actually, but with flash that's so bright that the, the background almost, almost falls into darkness. So it's like a studio flash set up on the street into which people walk uh, unwittingly, um, almost as if they're having their portrait taken, but in public space as they go about their <laughs> daily lives. It's a very perplexing, um, fascinating project. Um, and then coming up much closer, a, a, a photographer who, like David, is very, very active at the moment, um, Barbara Probst. And she, she works with um, synchronized cameras, two cameras, three cameras, four cameras, uh, radio controlled. So they all fire at the same time. And and a lot of her work is, is, is kind of triangulated views on the same subject. Um, and they, they are often, well, they're usually collaborating with her, but moving through a, a space that is non-collaborative. Non so she's maybe just working with one person to make the picture and then chance and things kind of happen around them. And I, and I don't think this kind of work would I don't know whether it's a question of whether it would be made or not. Um, I don't think it would be possible to quite understand it without this idea that public space is now so imaged anyway. To be in public space is, is to expect to be imaged somehow. Or we're not surprised when we are imaged in public space, put it, put it that way. Um, and then just a little kind of uh, cinematic nod or, or frame of reference. Um, I've always loved this film by Standish Lauder, experimental filmmaker. I think he's still alive. Um, he made a film in 1970 called Necrology and it's commuters in New York um, who are descending an escalator um, coming down into Grand Central Station and Lauder shoots it as a single take 
but uh, he plays the film, the final film plays in reverse. So everybody is ascending rather than descending. I think Lauder is in it. I don't think he's in the clip that I'm, I'm showing you here. Um, so a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock, he sort of makes a, a cameo. And of course, he would be the only one who, who knows what's really going on in the film. And again, it, it brings out this tension between um, a kind of theatricality in, in the way that the world is imaged uh, that comes out of the fact that um, the world's becoming more kind of theatrical anyway. Um, just in its presentation and in its kind of consciousness somehow. So the te my text sits at the back and some of those ideas are in there, but it's actually much more to do with cinema and theater, which is something that David touched on. And the, the title uh, of my essay, uh, EFMR7, <laughs> actually comes from this shot, uh, which I think David is the only one that's not, doesn't have a person in it and does have a, Pigeon in it. <laughs> yes, to my knowledge, yes, that's the only non-human in there. <laughs> yeah. How did how did that one happen? Did that that was by accident? Yes. Uh, there's a there's quite a pigeon community there in the station. So, <laughs> uh, but it, they they would kind of dive bomb, uh, cut across, and uh, I, I did quite annoy some of the people working in the station because the 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 birds would be so aware of, of eye contact so I was you know I was, I was trained my camera and then I would stare at them and then they would kind of prompt them to <laughs> I mean, the birds must look amazing as they they fly through the different colored light yeah absolutely yeah uh, there's also something about you know the way the way a camera kind of captures things in the way that eyesight doesn't quite you know something escapes it's eyesight and you can't quite you can't quite see it until it until it's photographed um, somehow. But I'm curious about your, your thoughts about, you know, public spaces as, as theatres, which is, which is something that you mentioned, and it is something that, that I talk about in, that, in the essay. Um, and I don't, because in a, in a way, uh, your, your project here, uh, in a way must have been something that that space was expecting. Let's put it. Let's, let's put it that way. Somehow, but, you know, it's, I mean, how could you, I mean, you've done it extraordinarily well, but how could one not do it? Um, maybe that's, maybe that's what happens when a project looks, you know, so gloriously great, but inevitable. You just think, oh, of course, of course, that's, this was, this was just a space waiting for a great photographer to come along. Uh, I don't know. What, what are your feelings about that? Well, it's it's funny because I you know I've lived in this neighborhood for uh, like around like twelve or thirteen years and I passed through that station so many times and you know of course you know I'm often taking pictures and I'm you know scrutinizing every you know insignificant detail to make a photograph of it but it wasn't really until that I was having that morning commute uh, that that I really took note of of that light. Um, Are they all morning? Were all the pictures morning? Yeah, some of them. Yeah, I, I, the vast majority are. Yeah, there's maybe some that are slightly later than that. But, right. Uh, but you know, most of the time, people when they're passing through there, they're in such a hurry, and they're you know, it it doesn't really seem to register the the quality of light. I mean, there's not that many people there. You know, you would think that there'd be people taking selfies and you know, photographing that light, but um, it really didn't see much of that. Yes. Uh, yeah. But what, the strange thing is that, I mean, this was, it's, you know, it is my neighborhood station and I would see people that I'd recognize and I was sort of hoping to get yeah. a neighbor, yeah. <laughs> a successful picture of a neighbor or something, but it never worked out. Uh, but <clears throat> so it, that, that added a kind of a, another unusual dimension to it for me. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. And how, how are people with photographers there? Is, is it a problem to shoot there or? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at, <laughs> at avoiding the conflict, but 
uh, you know, I was getting pretty close to subjects and most of the time people were too busy to, to even, to really care. Um, but uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't trying to be like the fly, the fly on the wall uh, yeah. in, the, in that yeah. station. Um, but there were, you know, a number of uh, things that I think I had to do in order to get, uh, in order to really make this project successful. I mean, I did get to know just kind of casually some of the, some of the station employees, uh, just, there was a lot of suspicion you know, people would come and tell me that they had been watching me on the security cameras. And, and so I would just, it was, it was easy to have, it was, it was fortunate that I, I had this, you know, this yeah. magenta light beaming down. I could just sort of say, Hey, this is, <laughs> This is what I'm photographing. Yeah. I'm photographing the light on people rather than them but assuming that, the worst. That's an interesting thing, and that that was that was the essay I didn't publish, which was uh, which was to do with the fact that you know there's this very strange thing in photography where you know because photography has this perfect kind of illusion about it, we we feel we're seeing people and places but all you all you ever see in photography is is a is a version of the light that bounced off them uh, we don't we don't we don't see people or objects or places we we see the it's the light that uh, that makes it that makes it possible and of course of course the character of the light affects you know how we relate to that space or that person or that or that object. Um, it's a very deep sort of philosophical thing about images, I think. Um, which I, I don't know, I feel is lurking there because in the end, everyone's quite unknowable um, in photographs, particularly in your book. You know, there are these kind of glimpses of people who you'll never know, or, or, or the chances of you knowing them are so slim. Um, and they're, they're given to be seen in this really extraordinary light um, uh, that, that highlights them and makes them into something else. And, you know, I look through the book and I kind of imagine what that would be like if those pictures would be like if they weren't in that light. And I mean, does it always look as good as it does in your pictures, the space? Is, is it, are there days where it just doesn't work, where there's no sense of color? Yeah, uh, there, certainly. When, when the, you know, on, on overcast days, there isn't that. That you know, you could the light is still kind of nice because there's large windows, but yeah. uh, it doesn't have that you know saturated color. Um, yeah, dramatic shadows that happen. Um, yeah, but it still is a, an interesting place. Uh, I don't. I mean, I continue to photograph even on those days. Um, what about the? What about the? the uh this the selection of the pictures and the sequencing of the pictures were, were there were there thousands to choose from or uh were, were there were the ones in the book just substantially better than everything else that you shot or tell me about how you get from the trawl down to the yeah i i, I mean i certainly am a you know i i take advantage of of uh the large uh, memory cards on the digital cameras and so I mean you know I did make thousands of pictures there um, so it does it, it is a challenge to to edit down but there certainly were images that were more successful than others um, right. <clears throat> uh, you know I think what what kind of guided the editing was the sort of mood that I was going for uh, yeah. and it sort of I, you know I kind of wanted the images to reflect sort of the kind of the precariousness of kind of life in, yeah. in New York City and the subway and and uh, and also the sort of the community here. Um, sure. sure. And of course it's definitely a pre-COVID book now. Uh, that's kind of cast its itself on everything. Every image of public space now uh, feels feels slightly different. Um, and also the the black the black borders really and the black pages really help was was that clear from the start that that's how you were going to make the book or was that a design decision that came along a bit later or uh, it it came along pretty quickly I mean the black I mean it you know there was some thought about 
using uh, ha the images, uh, you know, being not surrounded by black, but yeah. uh, just how the how that affects sort of the the perceived like tonal range of the images. Yeah. But I think it made I think it worked out. It sort of yeah, it, I think it adds to the sort of the cinematic quality. Yeah. It's got an interesting relation to your uh, your your previous project, or maybe it's not your previous project, but the the airplanes picture. How yeah. mm -hmm. you have a very um, I don't want to say targeted, but you have a very precise way of observing what's in front of the what's in front of you, um, and that's. Uh, and obviously, they both both these projects have uh, something to do with fleetingness going on, or anonymous people passing through the world. Uh, the airplanes pictures. What's that project called? I can't remember. That's uh, Landing Lights Park. Landing Lights Park. Yeah. yeah, where you have these shots where you where planes are in the sky, and you can actually see people looking out the windows of the plane. <laughs> I had to. It's a different. It's a different kind of passage, but there. I mean, there's definitely a kind of continuity there in the way you're thinking about what you want to try and make images of. Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, it. Um, you know, even in earlier projects, um, you know, there was there were some photographs of people, but also, but mostly it was sort of the presence of people and how they affected objects and the landscape and. Um, so maybe sort of jokingly, I kind of, you know, had to go through sort of uh, elaborate measures to to actually get up the nerve to photograph people. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, I can see prints on very tantalizingly on the wall behind you, and I'm curious. I mean, the book feels like it has a kind of perfect proportion about it. Um, everything is so extremely well considered and well well realized. But of course, a photograph is something that one can make at different sizes, you know, for different occasions and, and contexts. What can I see behind you there? Is that you working out how they will be as uh, exhibited prints? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, those, are, you know, this, those are sort of the larger portfolio size prints. And then, um, yeah, I'm working on, you know, how it would be interesting to try to see how this you know, sense of space could be achieved as an exhibition, you know, how the way that these photos of people move through the space. Uh, but you know, most of the exhibition prints I've been making are around uh, 30 inches vertical, by 20 right. inches wide. Um, interesting, yeah. interesting. Uh, do they have to be in a dark room and spotlit or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think. No, I don't know if that'd be necessary. Maybe just a, a black frame would be sufficient. But black frame. That would be interesting, interesting to see. You know, I'm, I'm always interested in how photographs move from one kind of context to another. But you know, the book is so sort of perfectly realized. Um, but I, I, I'd be curious to see how they are in a show. Well, thank thank you so much, David, uh, for pleasure. your pleasure. Uh, Congratulations yeah. again on the book. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, take care and uh, speak soon.